Welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show, uh, Ryan Benici. I should, I should say welcome back, uh, Ryan Benici, uh, CMO at, uh, at Whereby. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks for having me, Alex. It's great to see you. I wish we were in person, but um, this is better than nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely better than nothing. If um, Well, it, it will soon be in person, but probably uh, uh, probably 2022. I, I think we're, we're both double jabbed now. You, you've got both yeah. that. I think you got yours today or yeah. very recently, right? Not too long ago. Yeah. And it's been such a good feeling. I mean, I'm in New York and there's literally buses on pretty much like every other block that are just giving out free jabs to anyone, anywhere, tourists, doesn't matter. Like they're just trying <laughs> to get folks vaccinated. And I think the yeah. US is at like, a, I don't know, the majority of the country now is vaccinated. Yeah, I think they're. I think they're driving. Somebody is coming up to like seventy percent, which is uh, we, uh, which is incredible, right? And uh, I, th I think likewise, UK where I'm, I'm based, like it's doing really well. Like July the nineteenth uh, is the date where everything's kind of opening up, and they're looking at you know getting rid of the masks and going back to the office and that sort of stuff. And was yeah. life back to back to normal? Uh, as such, if there is such a thing as uh, as normal, but uh, uh, but a good feeling uh, as such, and we're even, you know, starting plan and dreaming of in person conferences again, which is obviously where where, where SaaS stock has, has come from. So that 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 is very yeah. exciting. Uh, you know, it's been. How uh, are you thinking about that? Is it because back in the day, was it it was predominantly in person? Was there a hybrid yeah. element back then, or? Yeah, no, well, there, there was a, a hybrid element back then in in the sense that um, Sasslock in Dublin, we actually always live streamed on Facebook. Uh, and, and so you, that was probably hybrid before hybrid was, mm. you, you know, a, a, a kind of term. Right. And so we yeah, did a live yeah. stream because there, there was always a, there's always an audience that's going to come because they see the value of it in person. Right. right. Uh, and, you, you know, doing the deals, going out for dinners, you know, the stuff that you can't do at a virtual conference. Mm. Right? Um, but, um, but there's always just a, a whole audience that would actually never, they're never quite sort of like perhaps sort of ready or they couldn't come because of a yeah. time commitment to come to Dublin, but actually they really wanted to see the great speakers that we are you know, putting on, um, so, um, so yeah, I, I wonder if that's way to think about it is like, is even like as a marketer, marketing companies, the way I kind of have viewed the online event side of the house is it's almost like a, a top slash a middle of funnel way to get people into the brand, into learning about the conference, like that stuff. Yep. And then if they, if you show enough value digitally, then, you know, in a year or two, maybe they then come in person. So I think it could work really nicely in like your sales funnel. I think, I think def definitely, I think the, the ability to, to do it sort of hybrid and even just doing like virtual events, right? I think what virtual events has done in, in the absence of us being able to do in-person events over the last, what, 18 months or so, um, it's brought in a whole new audience to, to SaaS stock, I would say, you know, into the funnel, uh, you know, in, in, in the in the market in terms that have been then getting value from our virtual events that will then hopefully be coming to our in-person conference uh, next year when it returns. So 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 that's great. And I think likewise, as you say, with with the hybrid side of things, uh, we'll we'll likely see that as well. That people will come, they'll they'll watch it online, you, you know, on on hop in, and then you know maybe next year they will say, look, I've got to be there in person, right, and experience some of the the in-person benefits. So. Um, uh, hopefully that, that that'll work uh, in, in that way. Um, but uh, but look, Ryan, but for those that um, haven't perhaps uh, heard of you uh, before, tell us a little bit about uh, you know who is Ryan Benici. Yeah, so you can probably hear from my accent. I'm Australian, um, born and raised there. European parents. Um, one of those weird people that knew at the age of ten or so that I wanted to be a CMO. I don't, I don't know where this like want or dream came from but I just vividly remember at a really young age wanting to be a CMO and so I've kind of just done all things marketing ever since then really from B2C to B2B to D2C to marketplace marketing um, to product-led growth marketing and I don't know I think every time I've moved to a new company I've sort of taken on a very different type or area of marketing um, and I think over time, it's really helped me actually start to have like a broader tool set of things. So when a problem comes up, 
I'm not just viewing it, I'm viewing it with solutions from like the PLG world or the D2C world or the B2B world. Like you can start to kind of pull in those different levers. And I think that's what helps me be a, a better marketer. Um, and that's sort of the, the thing that I look for when I'm looking for folks to bring onto my team. But yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me. And um, you, you, I think last time you were on the podcast, which is probably a couple of years ago, I think, uh, you were CMO at, uh, at G2. Uh, yeah. And you've also uh, worked at, at HubSpot. So two, two kind of great SaaS companies. These are the ones that I know. Uh, you're now yeah. CMO at a great company, uh, Whereby, which is going to be Future Unicorn. And uh, I don't know about <laughs> Zoom killer, but certainly competitors uh, to, to, to Zoom. Um, but would you say, um, what would you say like your experiences from like working in companies like HubSpot and G2 kind of like help shape the, the, the marketer that you are uh, today? Can, any, any, any examples around that? Yeah, well, so, so I started my market. It's funny, I've actually gotten, for, I've started at huge companies. So I started my career um, at Microsoft. Um, was that like kind of like my first really formal marketing job? You know, I think back when they had like 100,000 employees and then I went to, um exact target which was maybe two and a half thousand which is you know much more enterprise b2b marketing um and then salesforce which was more kind of like full stack in the sense of like sme mid-market and enterprise b2b marketing and then hubspot again is still b2b but the levers that you pull in an inbound high velocity high volume low acv kind of world are very different they're much more consumer oriented so um, yeah, it's been really interesting kind of like going through those experiences and then, and, you know, in the last few years and moving from HubSpot of like, what, two and a half thousand people to G2, I think it was about a hundred people when I joined and maybe 350 when I left. Um, and now whereby where, um, I want to say we're at maybe a hundred to 150 or so people now. Um, I think that probably the most the most um, foundational or the most shaping part of my marketing experience was um, my time, well, my time in Australia, really, because um, so anyone that works for, you know, a large multinational corporation, and I tell this to a lot of, you know, folks that are moving up in the ranks and more junior in their career, but if you're based in the UK or if you're based in the US and you're working at HQ, I always tell folks, try and get out to one of the regions um, because, you know, I, you know, grew up and started my career in region. And what that means is like when you're the sole marketing manager of your region, you're effectively the CMO, right? You might not have the title, but you are doing everything, right? So you're doing local PR, you're doing local content, you're doing local lead gen, you're doing local events, um, you're doing local paid acquisition. It's such a great um, kind of like learning ground, really. Um, and so, you know, I started, you know, as the first employer, first marketer at exact target, um, and then grew the marketing team to about, I, I want to say 25 or 30 people across, you know, Japan, India, New Zealand, um, Singapore, and, and then Australia, obviously. And so being that first person, I, I learned a lot about building teams, about international expansion. Um, and then I kind of then got known as the APAC marketing person. Um, so then, you know, after doing that at exact target, I did that at Salesforce and then I did that again at HubSpot. And then I think after doing that three times, then I kind of was ready to take on a more global role. And so HubSpot relocated me to Boston. Um, and then I took on a global role with them. And anyways, I think that kind of helped me get ready for being a CMO at a younger age, just because when you are in region, you're just forced to do all these different things because um, HQ, which is, you know, I have always worked for American companies, but, you know, HQ is busy with HQ things. And so you have to build a lot of your own strategies in region. Now that might not be the case if you work for like a really big product, sorry, like a really big kind of B2C company where it's very much the US sets the brand campaigns, they set the messaging, they build the website and you're just kind of executing on it. I don't think that's the same, but in the B2B world anyways, I think um, being in region can be a really, really nice way to, to just get thrown into the deep end and get a lot of varied experiences. And what, what was the lure of uh, whereby, you know, what, what was the, 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 the reasoning to, to move from, uh, again, what is a great company in, in G2 that you've been through a couple of years, to then go to 
what was a, a, a smaller company at the time, but is growing very fast uh, in, in Web. Yeah, it was wild. I mean, when I joined D2, I think um, we were valued at about a hundred million. Um, and then just after I left, they just recently raised another round in their unicorn valuation. So really cool to kind of like be a part of taking a company from, you know, a hundred mil valuation to I think one point, I can't remember if the value, I think it was about 1.4 maybe a billion, the most recent valuation. Um, you know, I think for me, it came down to like, I just had this obsession with learning and challenge, getting challenged. Um, and I think for me, like I'm pretty open and honest and direct with my boss whenever I join. So with whomever CMO I'm working for and that, you know, I, I like big challenges, give me lots of big challenges and I'll deliver on those and over deliver on those challenges for you. Um, and once I have done those things, unless I keep getting like more responsibility and more challenges, I just don't feel like I'm learning as much. So, so maybe it's a little bit selfish, um, but I, but I manage people's expectations from the get-go that like, I wanna drive really big results for your company, um, but I also wanna be challenged and I wanna be doing new things. Like I don't wanna be doing the same job for, you know, for half a decade. Um, and luckily in tech, you know, you know it's move, things move so quickly, companies shift so quickly that, you know, um, like I said, from a valuation perspective at G2, we grew it so quickly. And, you know, we did that through so many key marketing levers, right? When I joined G2, the board said, grow traffic. Cause you know, as a, as a double-sided marketplace, you know, you need buyers coming to the site looking for software and then you need sellers and then you're matchmaking them, right? And then you have the added variable of getting reviews from those users, which, you know, fuels the whole algorithm. So it was a really complicated business from a marketing perspective, which is what I wanted from the get-go. Like I didn't want a simple B2B SaaS company where you generate leads for a sales team. Like I'd done that for over a decade and, and loved doing that, but I was ready for a bigger challenge. And I certainly got that at G2. Um, but yeah, you know, I think when I joined our organic traffic was about half a million visitors a month. And I think when I left, it was nearing 10 million visitors a month. So um, you know, I think it, we grew traffic by like 15 X in that time. And that's the number of buyers coming to the site. And, you know, we grew revenue in, in crazy multiples at the same time. So I don't know. I just kind of felt like I'd done what I had set out to do there, um, and was ready for a new challenge. And it was also, I guess, you know, towards the end of the pandemic, I started at whereby, um, on, you know, just as we were kind of coming out of the pandemic, I started on the 1st of January this year. And I think, you know, last year going through the pandemic and just, I, I, you know, as everyone was, I was working remotely and I was starting to notice that all of the things, maybe the things that I like missed in a lot of the tools that I was using, you know, Zoom and WebEx and the other tools and, so I guess that the sector of like video was on my mind just because everything was video. And I think moving forward, everything will have video incorporated to it. That's not to say that in-person isn't still important, but I think now, as we said at the beginning, hybrid is kind of merging much more. Um, so it was just like very top of mind. And as I sort of do, whenever I am kind of at that point in my, in my job at a company or in my life cycle at a job, I guess, you know, I went to G2 and I like typed in what was the industry or like the sector of category that I was interested in. And, you know, it, it came down to video. And then I looked at the top rated tools and Webby's rated the number one easiest to use tool for video on G2, um, higher than Zoom and other tools. And so that then kind of piqued my interest. Um, and I think I started using the tool, just playing around with it. And I think I may have tweeted about enjoying the tool or something like that. And um, Avon, the CEO reached out to me and um, yeah, we started having a really good conversation and I was excited about the mission and the company's philosophy. And um, it was also a really nice blend of like US working styles with European working styles. and. Um, which reminded me a lot of being back in Australia because, you know, in Australia, you know, culturally on the work front, we operate much more like the UK in terms of kind of work-life balance and work hard, play hard. And um, in the US, it's a little bit more of like work hard, don't play hard, <laughs> work hard, don't play, just work your whole life. Um, and I loved sort of like the combination of being able to be in the US in that culture, but also have these European elements and, um, 
that's sort of kind of how it came about really. And so, yeah, a combination of, I guess, where the industry was at, where the product was at, where the team was at, I really connected with the exec team and was, um, had never met an exec team that functioned as well as Whereby's team. I mean, my boss, Avon, has done a really remarkable job, I think, at building just a really empathic, you know, super, um, super amazing exec team. Um, and then, you know, I went to Glassdoor, like I always do as well. I'm big into reviews and looked at what people had said about the company and, you know, it, it matched everything that I was hearing from the company. And that's kind of how it came about. Awesome. Awesome. Well, look, you, you know, for, for today, um, you, you know, we're thinking about the, the founders that are in the SaaS community that listen to this podcast, right? Often, you know, we're talking about early stage founders that are on that journey to, to 10 million ARR, you, you know, mm. many less than a million, oh, yeah. but... Uh, yep. but, but a few that are kind of, you know, uh, between sort of one to five, you know, on, on that journey. And, and what we're, we're speaking to a lot of them at the moment and, you, you know, the, the commonalities and the problems that I'm hearing, it's like, you know, Alex, we, you know, I'm, I'm the founder, but, you know, I'm, all I'm thinking about is marketing sort of right now. You, you know, we, we need growth. We need customers. Lead gen, you know, these are the problems, you know, customer acquisition, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this is what we're interested in. So I thought, given that, you, you know, uh, we, we, we have one of the best CMOs in SaaS, you know, on the podcast. Let, let's talk about some of this stuff, right? Exactly. And let's get maybe some of the some of the things that you're kind of seeing at the moment that could be kind of helpful for the listeners, yeah. maybe some things that you're doing at Whereby or that you've done at G2 or that you're just kind of hearing and seeing yeah, around yeah. Like what, what companies could be doing around this area. One of the things I'm definitely noticing, I think, as a trend, which I think kind of aligns with what you said founders are saying to you is that I think... I don't know, maybe, I feel like a decade ago, it was very much like every company was like sales first, right? You hired a really big sales team. It was very much kind of like, you know, like just jamming the, like on the phone and just kind of, you know, working as hard as you can, throwing sort of like spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks. And um, and I don't discredit that. I think that can absolutely work at work and you can learn a lot from it. But I think I'm seeing and I'm consulting with a lot more companies these days and they want to move from a, a purely sales driven model to a much more organic and or inbound model right like a, a machine that like works at nighttime essentially is what they're looking for so like when their sales reps aren't making calls how can I be generating fit fuel, fuel for them food for them essentially um, when they're not calling so that they don't need to do cold calling as much as, you know, just responding to inbound. And, um, and so I think I'm noticing a lot more founders like hiring heads of marketing that are more growth acquisition and kind of inbound oriented, which has been really interesting. And so I think, you know, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm really big on um, because I think that plus sales is just such a valuable, um, I don't know, I guess like, partnership ultimately um not to say outbound can't be great for you know sourcing whales right because whales are less likely to come in for inbound but whales that make up the majority of your diet right fish <laughs> and sharks do and so um and th that's really perfect for inbound in my mind so i'm really big on helping founders understand how to think about building a compounding reliable and sustainable acquisition source for their company and oftentimes that's a mix of paid sources, which do really well for short-term acquisition, but they're really expensive and they can really fuck with your CAC. Um, and CAC, customer acquisition costs, for folks who haven't heard that, which I'm sure most have. Um, and then, you know, that coupled with inbound marketing and generating content that your ideal customer profile, your prospects are looking for. Um, but that takes a lot more time, but it's something you should start really early because of the fact that it takes time. I think too many kind of startups at that one to five or one to 10 mark, they focus too much on kind of, um, what's the right way to put it? Like interruption-esque tactics, like advertising, like sales, which work, but they don't compound. Whereas if you can build, um, you know, product-led growth into your product, or if you can build like an inbound funnel, which kind of functions in the same way as product-led growth into your sales funnel, then, um, you know, yeah, you'll start to generate demand all the time. And so that's what I've been doing at Whereby. Um, we, we're yet to see the, I guess, or we're yet to kind of like reap the reward of all of that work because um, content takes quite a bit of time to develop, but then also to have enough of it to rank. 
Um, and so we've been doing a lot of different paid acquisition tactics. We've been doing a lot of different brand campaigns. So like, I think my first month after I joined, we launched Where by Forest, which we basically pledged to plant 1 million trees. And we said like, for every meeting you do on the Where by platform, we will plant a tree for you. And so we saw people planting more, sorry, we saw people doing more meetings because they had a little counter in their whereby tool that they could see how many trees they themselves were responsible for us planting. Um, and that was something that helped us grow awareness, but also helped us actually grow users and usage of the tool, which fuels people, you know, meeting with other people. And the more meetings that happen on whereby naturally because of the I guess like for viral sort of nature of our product, you can't have a meeting by yourself. And so if we can encourage our users to have more meetings and to have more effective meetings, and that is more people on the other end that are experiencing the whereby product. So whereby product was whereby for us was that a big campaign that we set up really early on. Um, and then we started doing more brand campaigns to help people understand who we were at whereby, because I did a, a really quick brand study when I first joined. And I think, you know, our market share in the US and the UK was in the single digits. Um, and, um, and so within that first quarter or that, sorry, that first half of doing more advertising, creating more content, doing more social, we were able to double our brand awareness and recall and rec rec recognition in the US and in the UK, which are two of our primary markets. Um, so that was a pretty big one for us. Um, but yeah, I'd say we're still kind of in the early days of building the team. It's still a really lean company, which is fun. Um, and yeah, it's exciting times. If, if you're the founder, like, I guess this, we, we would then have to look at like really pretty early stage. Uh, if the founder is still doing most of the marketing mm. uh, or certainly obsessing about sort of marketing, uh, at, that's uh, at this stage. So let, let's assume that there maybe yeah. a, a couple of hundred k ARR uh, in, in this instance. Yeah, yeah. Like at that stage, if you can't, you won't have the budgets to be doing uh, perhaps brand awareness. I, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But what are the things that you could be doing at that kind of really kind of like early stage to uh, to attract new customers to to get leads in? Yeah. So I think there's there. I think people sometimes kind of misappropriate brand campaigns or brand awareness with like the B2C world and being really expensive and it doesn't have to be right. So like a, a really simple example was I worked with one of our designers a month or two ago and we created these, these digital billboards because um, basically the wire cutter, wire cutter, which is part of the New York times um, basically reviewed all the different um, video meetings tools and they said of all of their kind of people that tested the tools, whereby was the tool that everyone preferred over Zoom. It was number one, Zoom number two, and then everyone else. Um, and which for me to hear is like so frustrating. It's exciting, but then so frustrating because I'm like, when someone uses whereby, they love it. They fall in love with it and then they stick to whereby. But how do you get them to shift their mindset to try something new when Zoom might be good enough? Um, and so we use this quote from the New York Times that basically said, I think the headline of this like billboard was like the New York Times says we do video meetings better than Zoom, try us, whereby.com for free or something like that. Um, and again, that was just, when I say digital billboard, I mean like digitally designed and then just promoted organically on social media. So no paid behind it. Um, and these billboards got picked up in lots of different publications. They were like talked about a ton on social and still are today, I get tagged in a lot of them. Um, and again, that cost me a few hours of a designer's time to do, right? But again, that comes back to having a good product that people are talking about. Um, outside of that, if you're still, if you're at the point where you don't have people talking about your tool yet and you want them to learn about your tool, um, I think one of the things that you can do is think about using content to build brand awareness. And I think this was something that I learned early at HubSpot because um, I mentioned earlier, later on in my HubSpot career, I, I moved to HQ and took on a global marketing role. Um, and that was because I was working closely with Brian, the CEO, and Kit, the CMO. And for the prior decade, HubSpot had never really done brand campaigns, which is surprising, right? Like a public company had never really done billboards, never really done ads, um, but they still had a massive brand and it's because they've created so much valuable content that people were looking for online. And I think people sometimes um, 
maybe don't understand the value of content if you create the right content that your buyers are looking for. And that can be a really valuable way for you to not only grow your brand, but also grow acquisition. So one of the things that I did really early on at HubSpot was, um, and this cost me, you know, again, we we're a public company, but this cost me $6,000 um, with my team in Sydney um, we created an email signature generator tool. It cost six grand. We used a little um, two person agency in Sydney. They basically created a website on HubSpot on our domain. So I think it's like hubspot.com forward slash email signature generator. If anyone searches email signature generator, I think it's the first thing that comes up. Um, and that kind of came off of this insight that like we were thinking about, okay, what do people that would use HubSpot, right? Business owners, marketers, what is something that they do in their everyday life? And we're thinking like, well, when someone starts a business or, you know, someone joins a new company, they create their email signature, right? And a lot of companies don't really have a process for that. So typically like you join a company, maybe you send an email or two to a, to a colleague and then you see their email signature and then you copy it, change your name and details. And so we had this bit of a hunch because that's what I did when I joined HubSpot. And I went on, um, on SEM Rush or AREFs and looked at um, keyword search and it was like a hundred thousand people every month were searching for email signature generator, email signature templates. Um, and it had really low competitive difficulty to rank for it. And so we we're like, wow, okay. Like we're not the only ones that are doing this. Lots of people are doing it. And so we created this tool and ultimately that became a lead form, right? Like when you fill out your email signature with your name, your address, your email, that's a lead form for HubSpot. And then within like three months, we were generating like a hundred thousand leads a month with zero paid spend because it was the number one ranking um, website for that search term. Um, and it was getting crazy amounts of social. Like if you just, if you just like, like once you find the URL, if you drop the URL of the page into social, you'll see every day, like hundreds of people are tweeting about it just because it's a really valuable and it's a free tool. I mean, this became, I think, one of the highest organic lead sources for HubSpot. And I think it still is today. Um, and again, it costs us $6,000 to do, right? And so I think you can use content to drive brand awareness and to drive acquisition the same way. And again, that example I just gave there, you know, I consult with lots of early stage founders on what that could be, what the HubSpot email sig generator could be for their industry. Um, and it's really easy. And so, you know, if there are founders that are listening to this and are interested, they can just tweet me um, or DM me. Um, you know, I'm just Ryan Benici, my name on Twitter or on Instagram, and I'm happy to get on a call and, and help them out. Um, and um, yeah, I get a lot of joy of helping companies learn kind of like low cost slash free ways to help them grow their business. Because um, I just feel like have a bad we have a bad name for ourselves i think from old school marketers where it's just all about spending money on these big fluffy brand campaigns that can't be measured and i really want to like help build the um the reputation of the folks in my field because i think this new breed of marketer is 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 much more kind of like revenue generating than maybe the past so they're just a few examples well amazing thanks for sharing that and, and actually um i'm, I'm glad to you you sort of mentioned because this is a nice segue in terms of like if, if anybody kind of wanted to tweet you or, or whatever contact for you to uh, that you, you'd be happy to speak to them because I did notice I think I've noticed both yourself and David Cancel, uh, who's the CEO of Drift, mm. um, perhaps sort of recently um, said uh, like put on social media like here's my phone number like call me or text me. I, yeah. I was thinking initially it's like. Are they mad or like you you know like what do they expect so like what was the what was the thought process around that interesting that both you you and dc uh sort of did that uh, and then what was the, the response did you were you inundated with whatsapp messages and like how uh, did you speak to so yeah it's funny so so that is actually a real number that you can use to contact me i think what people don't realize and it's maybe you intentionally withheld is like that's not my like personal cell number right so um, it's a service that you can use. It's called, there's a, there's a bunch of different services out there um, that do this. Um, and it allows you to kind of like have a public number that people can message to and you get their messages one-to-one. -one. You can respond one-to-one. -one. You can also respond one-to-many. Um, so like I, like, I haven't been using it as much lately, um, but yeah, you can use it to then kind of, you know, if you learn something new or you want to share, you know, a fun tip or something that you learn, you can send it out. 
Um, but yeah, I think in the first, with the first few months of me using that, I think I built up about maybe like four and a half thousand subscribers on this, on this SMS list, yeah. um, which became a little bit like tough to manage. But then the, the tool that I was using, it's called community.com actually does a really good job at like using, I think they use AI or predictive tools to kind of like, if people ask questions to you that are similar, it groups them all together. So you can say like, if everyone asks you a question about like a tweet that you wrote, or um, if everyone asks you like, you know, a question about acquisition, you can filter them all together. And then you can say all the ones that are about acquisition, I'm going to give you a blanket message back to them all. Um, and I think the idea with that is it's kind of trying to maybe go down like a Patreon model where you can have folks that then maybe want to pay for a subscription so that you then are giving them one-to-one -one advice more regularly versus one-to-many. Um, so it was, it was an interesting tool. And I mean, I think for me, I just, I just fucking love like new marketing channels, to be honest. And like SMS is by no means a new marketing channel, right? Like back at the, when I was at exact target a decade ago, you know, that was back in the day when cons consumer marketing companies were getting into sort of B2C e-commerce e SMS. And so if you were waiting in line, they would say like text Macy's to this like four digit number to get 10% off your offer. And it was just another channel now for marketers to market to you in. And, you know, it's always kind of, um, there's a value exchange, like you give them a bit of personal information and access to your phone number. And in return, they give you a discount, right? And the marketer is weighing up that, okay, by giving them a discount, I'm going to get more repeat purchase from them or a higher kind of, you know, cart value of each transaction. Um, but so I think to be a really good marketer today, because so much of it is digital, you have to just immerse yourself in all of these different tools that are coming out because as marketers your own as a marketer you're only really as good as the tools that you use um and i used to think it was just about the tools i think in the last five years i've learned that the tools always change and the things that don't change are like human psychology really good copywriting um really good customer service right all of the human elements of marketing i think is like a real forgotten art in b2b and in b2c marketing and i think once you learn that stuff you never need to relearn it and then it's just about adapting those lessons to whatever channel you're using so whether you're sending an email or a tweet or an sms you then have learned like how to <clears throat> how to structure a copy so that the first line makes people read the second line which makes them read the third line so yeah anyways it's funny that you bring that up um i didn't i hadn't seen dc doing that um but i'll have to check it out and subscribe to his list but um yeah it's just a really i think it can be a really interesting way to kind of have a bit more of a one-to-one -one connection with people what do you like given your experience and you've been a cmo for quite a few years now across different companies what do you where do you go to kind of keep the, at the top of your game to keep learning you know, obviously you're challenging yourself at work with new opportunities, but you, you know, uh, how do you, yeah, let's say, keep the top of your game? Yeah, that, it was, that was a bit easier earlier on in my career, if I'm totally honest, Alex. Um, and I feel like now it's gotten a lot harder, right? Like I think back in the day I used to subscribe, I would have subscribed to a few different blogs and now there's a lot of noise out there really. So I think for me, it's less about, it's more about following other people. I think I, Twitter is probably a really valuable way that I kind of stay up to date on things because I follow a, a lot of brands on social. Um, not part, maybe partly because I'm a consumer, right? And I might want to shop from them, but more so actually because I want to see what they are doing. So like if you go into my photo library on my phone, this always drives my wife insane because she can't find the right photos, but it's just like... 80% of my photos are screenshots. So actually maybe not 80%, but like half of them are screenshots of ads or just good copy. Um, and it's kind of like my personal swipe file, I guess. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think by just being a really avid consumer, that's a really easy way to stay top of your game because it's, it's not theoretical, right? You're not reading about a blog post of how to do something. Like you are literally seeing it live. So when I'm scrolling on LinkedIn or on Instagram or something and an ad stands out to me, like I stop and I consume it as a consumer. And I think to myself, like, why am I consuming this? Like, how did it capture me? And then I try and reverse engineer it. Like I do the exact same thing on TikTok. Like I fucking hate TikTok. <laughs> I don't use it as a consumer, but 
it's fascinating to me because of just the hierarchy of information, right? Like you need something needs to capture your attention. It can be video, it can be audio, it can be copy on the screen. But you know, in 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 thirty seconds of video, um, when there's you're competing with a lot of videos, you can learn so much as a marketer around what is engaging. So by looking at what's trending, you can learn from that and then adapt that into B2B strategies, into B2C strategies. Um, so I think I would say probably consuming media is how I learn. I, um, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's some, there's some folks out there that I think are just really good at their skill set who might follow as well. But, um, yeah, I think just being a really avid consumer and just trying to be really um, hyper conscious when I am, am consuming, why I am consuming what I'm consuming and how it got my attention. Was it good targeting? Was it good visuals? You know, what was that? Is there is there a book, one book that you would recommend to founders or marketers that are listening? They want to kind of grow their business, uh, which is a, a great yeah. part. Um, maybe I'll, I'll cheat and give you two. Um, and I don't, we've just moved house from Chicago to New York and I don't have all my books in front of me, so I can't remember the name of it. The, the two is, one of them is by a guy called Rory Sutherland. Um, I forget the name of it. It's a gold book. Um, and it's kind of about creativity and different ideas and thinking laterally. Um, I'm it's sure the you know. alchemy, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yep. Yeah. Something alchemy or something like that. Um, so that's a good one, more recent. And then another really great book, which again, I don't have it here. It's got a really long title. It's a huge book. It was published in the 1980s. It's by, it's by the founder of DDB, which is the huge ad agency. Um, and it's basically this book um, that I believe the founder created before he passed away. I don't know if he's still around now, unfortunately, but um, it's, this, it's this big book, very like picture heavy. And then it has a lot of copy around it. And it's basically how he thought about structuring ads, how he thought about copy, how he thought about product placement. And it's pretty old school, right? Like it's like TVCs and posters, um, but there's just so much to learn from it from a copy perspective. And I love that book and I read it probably, I don't read it front to back very often, but I'll just pick it up and read different chapters like every other week because there's just really good nuggets of information around how to structure offers, how to structure good copy, how to, how to like remove unnecessary copy to kind of get to the core of what you're trying to say. Um, so that's a really good one. I think if anyone searched like DDB, like, and, and find out that guy's name. There's like three name, three words, obviously they can find that book. Um, but um, yeah, and if they can't find it, feel free to tweet me and I'll, I'll find it myself. Cool, good stuff. Good stuff. And, and then uh, just one final uh, two questions. Uh, what's next, big one, I guess, what's next for Whereby? Uh, and then obviously where, where can people find you online? I think you mentioned already on, on Twitter. Yeah, but. sure. I mean, so it's a really exciting time at Whereby. I mean, we have, you know, most people know us for our meetings product, right? We have millions of people that, you know, use and sign up for whereby meetings, you know, every month. Um, but the other part of the business, which kind of just grew out of the pandemic and has been growing incredibly fast is called whereby embedded. And it's essentially um, the ability to embed video anywhere. So you can embed video into your SaaS tool. You can embed video into your website. Um, and so, you know, we have like, you know, thousands of organizations around the world from small to like, you know, fortune 500 companies that have embedded whereby video codecs and tools into their product. Right. So in the UK, if you do a video call with the NHS um, to do a video visit with your doctor, you log into, I think it's like nhs.gov.uk, you schedule your call and then you meet with your doctor in the NHS's portal. Um, that's all powered by whereby. Um, whereas a lot of, I think companies started using zoom and other tools. And what happens is you have to schedule it in their tool and then they send you a link before the meeting starts. And then the user has to go to their email and find a link and they're late and they click it, they download zoom. Um, so by embedding the video into wherever it is, is sort of this new tool that we built about a year ago and launched and just been like selling like hotcakes, um, so that's been really exciting. And right now, like there's a few key verticals that we sell to, but I think we're starting to think a bit more about how we can make that more of a, a horizontal play and how every company could integrate video into their website. And I don't mean video in the sense of like 
a Vidyard pre-recorded video, but I mean like live video. So how can you use live video as a marketing tool, a customer success tool, a sales tool? Um, so like an example might be if someone was trying to sign up for on your website and they'd spent five minutes there, they're showing high intense signals of interest in signing up. Imagine if like your pop-up could say, hey, would you like to like chat with Alex live right now on video to learn a bit more about SaaS talk? I mean, it probably wouldn't be you because you're busy, but one of your team members or your, your BDRs or something yeah. would then be on call in the same way that people are on call for like Drift and HubSpot chat, but this is now live video. Um, so there's some really interesting stuff in play in that world that um, that's growing really, really, um, really fast. It sounds interesting. You should you should sell that product to or speak to the guys at Circle. Do you know the okay. um, the community platform Circle? So we we use that for the SaaS founder membership. And something that oh, it's cool. missing is like video, live video, right? So if I want to do like a live video broadcast or uh, you know a live video conversation yeah. with Ryan Benici on the community platform, I can't do it. So I have to record a video and then upload it. Uh, and I, I think that's a, that's a missing feature. Yeah. So, I don't know if uh, you know anyone there, feel free to make an intro. Otherwise, yeah, send, shoot me the link afterwards. I haven't heard of it actually. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll, I, I, I will do. And, uh, and, and do just not to, knowing about this cool new tool, I need to check it out. Yeah, I'm, I'm useful for once. Uh, no, that's, uh, <laughs> oh, you're always useful. Uh, but uh, and, and then yeah, and people find you online. Uh, so at Ryan Benici. Yeah, I think it's at Ryan Benici. Yeah, B O double N I C I on all platforms. Good stuff. Well, Ryan, uh, been a fantastic guest. Learned some great new things today. Great to see you in your, your new place in New York. And uh, yeah, looking forward to have you over next time you're in town. That's it. That's it. And hopefully we'll see you in Dublin uh, uh, soon. Absolutely. Next year. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Ryan Benici. Cheers.